everybody. Thanks for having me. Like she said, I'm Jenny Badesme. I'm one of the chief residents at NYU Bellevue and one of the left in the hall of And despite the cold that I caught from a combination of slot machines and sleep deprivation on the ASAP, I'm really excited to be here to tell you guys all about TSA because in putting together this talk, I became a team leader and I want all of you guys to be as well. So let's start by talking about Tom. We're all emergency doctors in this room or about to be. And so we're really good at Tom. We can do those ABCs. We cut those off better and faster than anybody else in the world. We put really big lines and really cool tubes in people. And then really pretty quickly, we whisk the patient off to either the CAT scanner or the operating room. And we feel really good about ourselves because we need a disco. Admitted to trauma surgery, enter. Or if you work with bar men like a lot of students, enter, enter. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get to go back out to the emergency department and deal with the kind of controlled chaos that occurred while you're in the trauma bay. We do this a lot. It becomes really routine. It becomes really basic. I don't know how much opportunity everybody in the room has had to spend in a trauma operating room. I'm not a trauma surgeon. I'm an emergency resident. But I did medical school in Minnesota, and there I spent six kind of amazing weeks on a trauma surgery in rotation, where I did Q4 24-hour trauma call. And in Minnesota, people drive a lot faster than they do in Manhattan where I work now. And despite being the land where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average, people there actually stab and shoot each other a lot more than you would expect. <laughs> So most of my overnights I spent in the operating room all night for one kind of trauma case or another. And one of those cases is a case I will literally never forget. <coughs> so the patient is a woman who's driving on the freeway on her way to downtown Minneapolis to celebrate her husband's recent promotion. When her car is struck head on by a drunk driver whose car jumped immediately. So PSA for the day, don't drink and drive. She comes into our trauma bay and she's hypotensive. She's obviously not alert at all. She's very unstable. She has a grossly positive fast exam. And she remains unstable despite our massive transfusion and all of the team's resuscitation efforts. Let's be honest, I stood back like this. So now we literally are running this patient to the operating room for her SF. And I'm running and I'm pushing and I feel so cool and the theme music from ER is like laying in my head like and I feel really cool. And then as soon as those surgeons open her belly, it is not cool. Her liver and her spleen are shattered into more pieces than we can possibly count. And there is more blood than I have ever imagined could cool in the belly. I'm a third year medical student, so I'm responsible for suction, and the catheters are literally doing nothing. So I'm handed this bucket by this drug tech, and I am scooping blood out of this patient's abdomen. And so the surgeons are stitching, and they're packing, and they're stitching, and they're packing, and they do the best they can, and they, they you know, deal with this bleeding as best they can, and then they put this big kind of temporary closure on her, and we wheel her to the SICU, and we just have to wait and see how she's doing. Bleeding like that did not seem basic. Bleeding like that seemed terrifying. But I'm here to tell you there's something that you can do down in the emergency department, something very, very basic that's going to help that patient. So, as I was putting this talk together, I was thinking about basics. What are basics? And I remember these question words that we learned back in elementary school. What, where, why, when, and how. And I thought, let's use that as a way to talk about something very basic like transdemic acid and help me convince you guys that you should be able to. So let's start with what? What is transdemic acid? Transdemic acid, and this last time I'm going to say it's really hard, is also known as TSA. And TSA is an anti fibrinolytic fibrinolytic agent. It is a synthetic analog of the amino acid lysine. And it works as an anti fibrinolytic by binding reversibly to the lysine receptor sites on plasmid and plasmogen. And by doing this, it prevents the plasmid from binding to and degrading the fibrin, okay? And this allows the fibrin matrix structure to stay intact in your blood and pop. 
I did not put the body casting on this slide, and that's what I didn't want you guys to hate me in the first five minutes of talking to you. I hope that worked. So TSA was discovered back in 1962, and it's been on the World Health Organization's list of essential medications since 2011. It's been used in countries like Japan and Great Britain over the counter for things like heavy menstrual periods for years, and it is cheap, 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 and yet we're not using it enough. Okay, so where? The major data for using TSA in trauma comes from the CRASH-2 trial, which was published in Lancet in 2010. Now that's the major trial dealing with this medication trauma, so we're going to talk about that one for the next few minutes, but because I really want to convince you, we will talk about some other data later. Why? Well, why is pretty obvious, right? Hemorrhage is a major cause of death for patients who are uh, suffering from trauma. It happens in a couple ways. There's obviously the direct bleeding that results from a, from a trauma to an organ or a tissue, which is what I saw in my patient in the operating room. But then there's also this thing that happens to the coagulation, and then we get coagulopathies, and I probably have to put a coagulation cascade up, but we're not going to talk about that because it's really not that important for you to understand me, but that also happens. So we know that if we can prevent some of that bleeding and some of that coagulopathy, that we probably should be able to have better outcomes for our patients. So CRASH-2 looked at over 20,000 patients who had significant hemorrhage or who were at risk for significant hemorrhage based on their hemodynamic instability. It was done at 274 hospitals in 40 different countries, so it was a major trial. Patients were enrolled in either the placebo group or the TSA group, and they had to receive those medications within eight hours, and it was done with a double blind placebo control, you know, the best kind of study you can do. What did they find? At four weeks, they found a significant mortality benefit for the patients who received the TSA. They found all four cause mortality rates in the patients who received TSA was 14.5% compared to the 16% for the patients who did not receive TSA. That's good. Mortality benefit is good. We love that. But, Jenny, what about the risks? If I'm going to give this medication that supposedly preserves the fiber major structure, isn't my patient just going to plot all over and then they're going to die from the mass of pulmonary embolism and they're going to help them anyway? Well, they thought about that in crash too, and they looked at it. They looked at the rates of phenoclusive events, including MI, PE, DDT, and stroke, and they found no significant difference between the TSA and the placebo groups. Okay, so the rate of a venal thromboembolic event in the TSA group was 1.7%, and it was 2% in the placebo group. So no big difference in clotting badness between the two groups. That's good. So when? The next delicate question is when. When should we be giving this? So, in a separately published but predefined group of uh, analysis of the CRASH-2 data, they found that there was a significantly improved rate in the improvement of mortality if the patients were given the TSA within the first hour. And they found a less good, but still there, improvement in mortality rates if it was given after three hours. So we want to be giving this within the first hour. And that might be hard, I mean, we need this to be on our ambulances, but it's better if we can do that. So who? Who should we be giving this to? That's easy. You're going to give it to patients who are bleeding. But I told you I'd give you some more data, so let's look at the MATTERS trial. The MATTERS trial, again, looked at TXA in patients who had significant damage. And again, they found a mortality benefit for the patients who received the TXA. They found a rate of 17.4% for the people who got TXA compared to 23.9% for the patients who didn't. Now, what's interesting about the MATTERS trial is that then they went on to look at the patients who had significant, much more significant hemorrhage, right? Patients who needed activation of the massive transfusion protocol. And here, they found an even better Here, they found a mortality rate for patients with TSA of 14.7%. And then they found the non-TSA group had a mortality rate of 28.1%. Now, I just told you a lot of numbers. And for all you know, I just made them up. And I have taken a lot of home medicine over the last two days, so for all I know, I do know. <laughs> but the next number I'm going to tell you is on my next slide, so I know I can make it up. The next number is, when you boil all those numbers down together, what you get is a number needed to treat a seven. Seven for 
medications requiring massive transfusion to prevent death or worsening cardiomyopathy. Now that's important, so I put it up here and I'm going to say it again. If you give this inexpensive medication to just seven patients requiring massive transfusion, you can prevent death or worsening cardiomyopathy. That is a great number to treat. Okay. So if I still haven't convinced you that you should be giving TXA, let's talk about one more study. This is from the BMJ Emergency Medicine. And they looked at the data from the CRASH-2 trial, as well as the mortality statistics from the World Health Organization. And what they did was they estimated that there are probably about 400,000 in-hospital deaths due to bleeding each year across the world. Now, if we can give TXA to bleeding hospital patients within the first hour of getting there, we can save 128,000 premature deaths. Now, an hour might be too optimistic. Maybe we can get it into our patients within an hour. Okay, so if we can give it to all of our patients within three hours, we can still save 112,000 lives. That's a lot of lives saved. Now, I told you several times that it's inexpensive, but just how expensive is it? I found an interesting cost analysis from the Journal of the Public Library of Science, where they did a lot of math by very smart math people. And they looked at outcomes in terms of life years aimed. And then they looked at costs, including the cost of getting the TSA, as well as the cost of hospital days. And it's a really interesting article, you should look at it, because they wanted to compare costs and see if it was cost effective in three different settings, low, middle, and high income countries. So they looked at Tanzania, India, and the UK. And so for the purposes of time, let's assume the US is most like the UK, and we'll look at that data. After all their complicated math, what they found was that giving TXA costs $64 per light year saved. I don't know about you, but I find it easy to spend more than $64 on dinner in New York City. And it doesn't matter how good the dinner is, it's not as good as I'm going to say. Okay, so that brings me to the H question, because it was very confusing when we had to learn our question words. They were all W's and then one each. And the H is how, and how is very easy. You're going to give one gram IUOLUS, followed by one gram infusion over the next eight hours. That's important, and I want you to remember it, so we're going to see it again. One gram, I think it was, followed by one gram over the next eight hours as an infusion. Okay, so what do I want you to remember about TXA? First, there's a mortality benefit. Remember that number needed to treat is just seven for patients who require massive transfusion to prevent death or worsening by the body. Two, give it early. The benefit is better if you can get it within the first hour. So the second you are starting to worry about your bleeding patient, and for sure if you're activating your massive transfusion protocol, you should be giving your TSA. And then last, I want you to remember how to give it. Because the trauma bay can be a crazy place, and you're going to be more likely to give this if you can just remember off the top of your head how, and it's easy. So you're going to give one gram IV bolus, and that's probably all you're going to have to do, but then remind your surgeon colleagues that they're going to give another gram as an infusion over the next eight hours. Okay, I'm going to put in one last plug for the fellowship because it's a fantastic opportunity. You get to work with great uh, emergency medicine and education faculty. And if you have any inkling from my home state and academic, it's a great fellowship for you. So please reach out to us. Thank you very much.